Databricks added Postgres to the lake house and called it Lakebase. Could this be a wallet killer at 40 cents per DBU or could it be the smartest move in data this year? Databricks in the last decade has mostly been focusing on the analytics side of data infrastructure. With Databricks normally you analyze large amounts of data. That's all app. Online analytical processing. Think about complex data analysis, business intelligence and proper decision making. This has been Databricks' bread and butter so far. Object stores were not exactly designed for the type of workloads that OLTB databases need. A 100 millisecond query is plenty fast in the lake house for analytics, but 100 milliseconds is actually unacceptable for OLTP workloads. We need single digit millisecond latency. Lakebase is OLTP plus lake house. OLTP is online transaction processing, and that's a system designed to handle a large volume of transactions in real time. The Databricks, we've been working on how to tackle this problem and actually eliminate all of the challenges. So with transaction processing, Databricks expands into a whole new and bigger market. And the result of that is Lakebase. I'm Dan Williams, I'm a Databricks MVP and the Partner Solutions Architect Champion, and I've been working with Databricks Technologies since early 2017. So Obviously, I'm excited about Lakebase. Build on a novel decoupled storage from compute architecture that actually enables the modern day developer work. Okay, that's great. But what is Lakebase really? It's a fully managed Postgres instance. It scales, it lives inside Databricks, and it integrates with Delta, Unity Catalog, Databricks apps, and others. It separates storage and compute, okay? That means your data sits in cheap object storage and compute spins up and down in under a second. The thing about cheap storage, okay? It's cheap to a certain extent. For, for industries like capital markets, for example, they can get quite expensive, but still it's cheap on average. But it's also slow for small random input output. We need single digit millisecond latency. So the way we've solved that is by introducing a middle layer storage that's actually only have soft state and it acts as a write-through cache for all the data to the object stores. So Databricks introduced the soft state cache in the middle tier to hide that latency. But how much memory does that cache use? How big does it need to be? I'd love to see some clear sizing guidance because otherwise you're going to end up guessing how much cache to allocate, okay? And under high concurrency, if the cache constantly evicts and reloads that data, that can actually increase costs. And this middle tier, okay, this is gonna be very interesting to see how it performs. Now, why is Databricks doing this? It's simple. They want to own the full data stack, not just analytics. You split the database into a base and a lake layer, take the data that's sitting in these traditional transactional databases, and you store it in lakes. So basically disrupt that tra transactional database. OLTP is a huge market. It's bigger than OLAP, bigger than Snowflake, Databricks, BigQuery, and Fabric combined. Databricks wants our Postgres workloads. It wants our APIs. It wants our transaction apps. They want them all to sit next to our Delta tables. In Databricks' ideal world, you won't need MongoDB. You won't need Aurora. You won't even need some Kafka. You just run everything on Lakebase. Pretty much Databricks wants to position Lakebase as a one-stop shop where both your application data and your analytics live side by side. So you don't pay for multiple specialized systems and you don't have to manage them. That's what we're super excited about. A simple idea, but kind of hard to pull off. And we think this is gonna be the future of all databases. I think this is a bold statement because it implies that Lakebase could handle all of the workloads that are traditionally split across different tech stacks. This is gonna be underpinning your most important precious AI applications in the future. Let's talk about the AI angle, because we cannot really do a video and not talk about AI. That would be weird. They keep repeating that Lakebase is built for AI agents. 80% of the databases created on Neon.com um, were created by AI agents, not humans. So AI agents actually create four times more databases. Databricks claims that most new databases are spun up by AI agents now, not by humans. So the branching and the elastic scaling of Lakebase this should make it cheap to have thousands of Postgres instances running for agents. But again, this is more vision than reality at this point because most teams don't really have thousands of AI agents just building databases. Yet, okay? We're gonna see how this goes. And since I mentioned branching, this is a feature that I love and I think it's great that now we have it for databases because the idea of spinning up a full database clone in just under a second is great. But without controls, without strict controls, you can imagine thousands of branches just left lingering around, each with schema tweaks or with experimental data. 
that could drive up storage costs, even if storage is cheap on average. So you're gonna need to build automation to clean up stale clones or govern who can branch and pretty much have strict controls overall. That said, this is the first time that we see Postgres behave like a true Git native database. Copy on write makes every branch quite cheap and servers lets you launch or kill those clones instantly. I think for both engineering teams and also for AI agents now, this makes feature testing, rollbacks, and even AI agent experiments. It makes things practical without the infrastructure headache. If you're looking at Lakebase, this is where Decision Force can help you. Connect with me on LinkedIn if you're exploring this, because I would really love to know how you're thinking about implementing Lakebase in your company. Now, let's talk about cost, because cost can actually make or break the whole thing. We're looking at 40 cents per DBU hour plus storage. Storage is built separately on low cost object storage like S3 blob storage. And when workloads scale down to zero, that's the only ongoing cost. Databricks markets lake base as cheaper than traditional OLTP databases exactly because of this, the separation of storage and compute, which lets you scale to zero and prevent over provisioning. Also by using an open format, data migration costs are minimal. And branching databases is almost free because you only pay for storage changes when you modify a branch. Otherwise, clones share the same storage. These were the good parts, but costs can still climb, especially with thousands of Postgres instances just spinning up and down. And with today's vibe coders, okay, they might not pay attention to what their AI agents are doing or how many branches they just leave off hanging around. Also, as I mentioned before, okay, cache layer costs are not fully transparent because we have a soft state cache that handles low latency operations and write ahead logs, but how much memory does this cache consume? Would it be great to have some t-shirt sizing instead of just having to run all of these benchmarks manually? Listen, this really does simplify architecture for a lot of teams. Now you can build apps entirely inside Databricks from ingestion to machine learning to reporting without duct taping Postgres and Delta. Unity Catalog also syncs permissions and Lakeflow syncs the data. So you have everything in one place. So is Lake based quote unquote game changing? Is this cutting edge? Am I still buzzing about it? Yes and no. Technically scalable Postgres isn't really new. Okay. You get Aurora, Neon until the acquisition, you get Cockroach, all exist. The novelty is the tight Databricks integration. And of course the developer experience. If you're already all in on Databricks, this will save you a lot of time. But if you're not, it can give you an extra reason to move your workloads to Databricks. Obviously it's not perfect, but it's a big strategic move. Whether it changes your stack or not, it actually depends on how much you already use Databricks. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. And if you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. And also connect with me on LinkedIn because I would love to know what Databricks use cases you're working on. I'll see you in the next one.